I'm sort of reviewing the film. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hello everyone. This is Darren Fink with Transfiguring Adoption, and I'm so glad that you could join us today. Uh, to Transfiguring Adoption is a nonprofit program, and we create and try to make resources for foster and adoptive families to help nurture and grow them. We say that we uh, nurture kids by making sure we take we give a hoot about their caregivers. Um, I'm excited. We have some great people on our discussion panel today, and the topic today is using media to bond with your kids. And we're really excited about that. And I'm going to go over some housekeeping things real quick before we get into it. And I and I introduce our panelists. Um, first of all, I just wanted to let everyone know after thanking you here that. This event is in no way, shape, or form meant to be used as legal or medical advice, and nor should it be used to replace any advice that you're receiving from the agency that you're working with, any foster or adoptive care agencies that you're working with. Um, all that to say, please don't sue us. We're just doing this to make a great conversation and hopefully give you some advice and help you out and know that you're not alone um, in, in the struggles and trials or even the good times that you're having as a caregiver. Um, and I did also want to let you know that we have a monthly discussion panel that we have a different topic every month and a different crew of experts and professionals that want to talk to you and answer your questions. Next month is uh, September and we're going to be talking about when partners don't agree and that's going to be, we're going to be discussing what happens when uh, you as the caregivers don't agree with how the kids should be raised or how events and things should be handled and what that can do and um, how you can handle that better. So go to our website at transfiguringadoption.com um, under the resources tab and you can find out more information on that. That'll be the third Friday also of uh, September. Um, and then lastly, this is an interactive discussion panel. We're going to have a Q&A time that's going to be really exciting. These, these, uh, we've got some really, really great uh, panelists on here that you're going to want to ask your questions to and just pick their brain. And you can do that by going on to Twitter and using the hashtag TAdopt. That's T as in Tom, and then adopt. Use that hashtag on Twitter. Use it on Facebook. I will be checking those periodically through our discussion time to grab your questions. Also, Google Hangout has, if you're on a desktop, has a Q&A panel over to the left side that you can type in your questions, and I will be looking at those questions as well to get to our panelists. So the second uh, portion of this will be Q&A time, so you can ask Margie, Gail, and Addison any of the questions that you have um, that could deal with m using media with your kids or just anything that you want to ask them. Um, but without further ado, I wanted to uh, I'll ask my first question here, and then our panelists are going to introduce themselves. Again, uh, the topic is using media to bond or connect with your kid. Um, and the reason we came up with this is we, uh, at Transfiguring Adoption, we really uh, believe that movies, books, and songs are a great way for you to connect with kids and help them work through some of their trauma. But uh, we'll get into that later. Panelists. Could, uh, I don't care who starts us out, but could you briefly introduce yourselves and what expertise you're bringing to the table today? I'm Gail Swift. I have two children that were adopted as infants domestically. Uh, they're now 31 and 29, respectively. I'm a certified coach. I work with adopted families. <clears throat> co-founder of Get Family Services, and I co-authored with my adult daughter, who's a teacher, a children's book called ABC Adoption and Me. I'm also, if you will, the survivor of out-of-home placement for two of our children, and we live to tell the tales that we're still an intact family. Hmm. Thank you, Gail. Mm -hmm. It's good to have you on. If you guys haven't checked out her book, uh, we actually reviewed it on uh, the Transfiguring Adoption website. It's a phenomenal book that your family really does need to check out. So, Cool. Uh, my name is Addison Cooper. I'm a licensed clinical social worker uh, out here in California. And um, my uh, 9 to 5 job is I'm a clinical supervisor at a foster care and adoption agency in California called Quinonia Family Services. Um, but then outside of that, I write about movies 
for foster and adoptive families on a website called Adoption at the Movies, uh, which has been going for about three and a half years. Uh, it's pretty fun. Uh, and I've got a book coming out also called Adoption at the Movies that should be coming out in January. Uh, um, and in the meantime, I, uh, I'm glad to be here with, uh, with Gail and Margie and Darren and uh, looking forward to talking about adoption and media and bonding. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and Addison, could you give them the, your website for Adoption at the Movies? Sure. Uh, Adoption at the Movies is www.adoptionlcsw.com. Or, or you could just go to www.adoptionatthemovies.com, and I have some buttons up there that will link you to the, the site. I really need to get that fixed so that it's just the main site right there. But uh, adoptionatthemovies.com or adoptionlcsw.com. Uh, and then uh, we got about 300 movie reviews up. Um, each review kind of gives a, an overview of how a movie connects to adoption, some strong points, any concerns, some questions to use. Uh, mm -hmm. to have a family discussion using the film. Um, so they're all there. And uh, the most recent one we put up, I think, is Pete's Dragon. Uh, unless I put one up since then. I don't remember. <laughs> and uh, I did have the little prints up pretty soon. Um, well, and I need to tell everyone, too, just like I was saying with Gail, uh, Addison has a great resource with his website, so you really do need to check that out. Um, there are already quite a few... Um, uh, quite a few, I mean like thousands and thousands of people that are checking out adoption at the movies to make sure they're making a good movie choice for their family. So um, definitely check out that website. Um, Margie, you are going to be our last panelist to get introduced. All right. I am Margie Fink. I am the co-founder of Transfiguring Adoption um, along with Darren and we have four children adopted out of foster care in my pre-transfiguring adoption and pre-kid days, um, most of my career experience has been in social work and teaching. Um, so I have, that's been my experience before kids. And, and now um, we're just working on doing the best we can to nurture and grow our family. And uh, Margie, one thing that uh, in your personal life, the adventure that you've done in the not-too-distant past, was uh, you were able to speak on Capitol Hill. Um, you want to tell people about that real quick? Yeah, sure. Um, there's a movement to try and save the adoption ta tax credit. Um, it's been really important. It was a bit, played a big role in helping us to be able to adopt and um, expand our family and to help the kids. Um, and so I had the opportunity to go as a parent and talk about um, we had two kids that we adopted during the tax credit and then two that were after that time and um, just being able to explain to uh, Congress just the impact that that had. So. Phenomenal. And Margie also re reviews books for adults on foster care and adoption on the Transfiguring Adoption website. So she is... Also, as Gail and Addison is a wealth of knowledge as far as media to help your family out. So thank you so much, you guys. Appreciate it. You guys, uh, I don't know if everyone realized the gems that we have here tonight, but we, we really do have a great panel tonight. Um, start us off, you guys. Let's, let's have a little fun. I want it since we're talking about media, what's the last TV series that you've gotten into or that you've binged watched? What's the last TV series that you've really gotten into on TV or something that you've binged watched lately? Uh, for me right now, I'm kind of addicted to America's Got Talent. Nice. Uh, I, uh, I actually, a friend hooked me up with tickets to one of the audition shows, so I actually got to be there live when this, this one uh, teenage contortionist uh, did this crazy trick where she... Uh, I don't even know how she did it, but she was bending over with her legs over her head, and, and with her legs over her head, she used her feet to shoot a bow and arrow. Uh, oh, that is crazy. It, it was the weirdest <laughs> thing. So, uh, so I'm definitely watching the rest of the season. Uh, and, then, and then for scripted shows, uh, I'm really enjoying going through Chuck again. Nice. Uh, Good deal. Yeah. For me, I was late to the program Lost. 
Mm. So we just finished uh, binge watching that. My husband is not well, and so we're more TV than we used to. <laughs> Hey, I remember binge watching Lost. I was late to the game on that one too, and that was a good series to binge watch. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and we we've been very late to the game, but um, we've been binge watching Downton Abbey. That's when the kids go to sleep. That's our our um, one hour of of grown up time, and uh, we're excited because we're getting ready to go visit the Biltmore Mansion. Um, so when we watch Downton Abbey, it's like, oh, I can't wait, because it's just, it's very similar, so. Well, and I have to say one of the shows that I enjoy watching the most is Once Upon a Time. Um, our family watches that every Sunday when it's on, so that's one of my favorites. But the last fun question I have for you guys is, what is your favorite, it doesn't have to have any reason other than you just like it, what's your favorite Disney movie? Hmm. For me, actually, I'm going to go first. It's Fantasia, which is the original. Because when my son was young, he was very sickly. And whenever he was homesick, we would watch that together. So he has lots of memories of nurturing times together. So we still, he's 31 now, and he still loves that movie. Aww. Um, gee, I, th I think it's a Disney Pixar, but uh, Up. Um, the the, the first 10, 15 minutes of Up are like, the, the most powerful 10 minutes of film I've ever seen. And, uh, I mean, it's it's embarrassing, sort of, to cry at an animated movie. It's really embarrassing to cry at 10 minutes in. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but Up is pretty awesome. No, I'll agree with you, because actually, um, wow, it might be TMI, but Margie and I were actually trying to have children, and we saw Up, and it, it really struck a chord with us when we were watching that first part of Up. Um, we could identify with their pain. So, yeah, we can totally agree with that. What about you, Marjorie? What's your favorite Disney movie? Oh, goodness. I'm going to go old school. And, and Well, it's not old, old school, um, but Lion King. Um, and it was one that impacted me as a child because I had lost my dad. And um, and it so it really, um, and I, I think I was in high school when it came out, um, and I, I bawled my eyes out. <laughs> Think about bawling at an um, animated film. And then it just seems like, you know, not too long after that, I was um, caring. I was caring for a cousin, and and he was into it. And it was, you know, one of those movies that you get a toddler and they just want to watch on repeat. And then our youngest did the same thing, wanted to watch that again on repeat. Um, so I, I think I have every single word. I, without it being on, I can um, quote every line in order <laughs> that movie. So. Well, folks, we have, I don't think it's any secret why I have the three of you on a topic for uh, using media to bond with kids. Because, you know, you're experts not only in the fields of cinema and books, but you also have the piece of you guys are experts in the field of foster care and adoption. So I, I think the first question that I, I want to ask you, and, and before I do that, let me pause again and just tell, uh, remind our audience that while I'm asking our, my questions, you can also be asking your questions to me. Just make sure that you use the hashtag on Twitter or Facebook of hashtag T as in Tom, adopt, or use, if you're on a desktop computer watching this, you can use the Q&A uh, chat panel on here and I will get your questions and be able to look at them and get them to our panelists. Sorry guys, but what I was going to say is I need to ask you guys as experts when we're having a stressful day as adults it's so nice to lose yourself in a book or a movie. Why do you think that is? Well, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is that it, it gives you a chance to reset. I mean, maybe in the same way that sleeping lets you reset, uh, t uh, escaping into a book or a movie or, uh, for me, I actually have uh, an hour commute most days, and so I escape into an audio book, and it's just a really great way to, um, I don't know, let my subconscious work on my thoughts for a while while I, I turn my attention to something unstressful and pleasant. For sure. I think too it can it can do a couple of things. One is it it can provide a distraction to quiet quiet the stress. 
if it, it's just for entertainment, but it also can offer illuminate solutions, um, give you an idea that somebody else is in the same boat. What did they do? What did, what did they think? How do they overcome things? So you, you can have a peer group. You can have a, a, a window into someone else's experience, and it might give you an idea of how to cope in your own life. Yeah, I agree. There's um, just a lot of power in, in media and being able to look at other people, what other people are going through, whether it's a fictional character or you're talking about a memoir. And this summer I spent a lot of time, um, rather than going through a lot of attachment theory type books or books um, that were more about learning, I did a lot of just reading memoirs. And um, it, it was real. it's you gain a lot um, hearing other people's experiences, knowing that you're not alone in your experiences, um, mm. and just seeing how other people have handled some of the same stressors. Um, it's interesting. I think, too, one of the, the, the big issues, mm. if you're a married couple and your spouse says to you, we need to talk, your heart kind of sinks and your <laughs> it's stressed to raise anything over and over a big argument, a big discussion. I think with kids on adoption issues, it's sometimes it's the same thing. If you, if you haul out a book specifically on adoption, then they kind of put on their an insulation. But if, if you get a book that's fiction about something similar to their life experience but isn't specifically about adoption, you can talk about it through a third person and kind of get, get it at the child's uh, stressors through a back door and have to talk about how Johnny does things as opposed to what do you think you should do in your own circumstance. Well, Gail, and that's a good uh, jumping off point, actually, to the next question that I was going to ask, and that's why is it, why does it seem like it's easier, even for us as, an, as a supposedly healthy adults, why is it easier to talk about an issue that's happening to a character in a movie or a book or a song? Why is it easier to talk about their issues rather than talk about our own issues in our own life? I think a lot of times, especially um, if it's something that might be shameful or embarrassing or you're just not ready to talk about, it's a non-threatening way you can project those feelings onto that character um, or, you know, process through some of how they're feeling um, in a non-threatening way. I agree, Margie. I think also that in order to talk about our own problems, we have to be personally vulnerable and expose ourselves. Whereas if you can talk about a, th a third person having the same issue or similar, you're talking about them. You're not talking about me. But very often you're revealing your thoughts and your emotions as you, as you project, as you say, um, on the, the character. And it doesn't require you to kind of open your kimono and show all where you're vulnerable. Yeah, you know, I, I think um, I think that it kind of gives you a chance to, to try on your responses or gives somebody a chance to try on their responses without owning them as their own. Um, I mean, we do that in all sorts of stuff. I mean, how, how big of a cliche is it to say, well, I've got a friend who's got this kind of a problem they're dealing with. <laughs> so you know, these are just uh, a way for us to give somebody the friend to talk about. Um, you know, and then uh, also I think, too, um, Maybe if I'm if I'm looking at somebody else, I can see things. I mean, somebody else in a similar situation to my situation, I can see things clearly. Whereas if I'm looking at my own situation, I've got my own defenses that are going to jump up and and stop me from seeing things clearly. Um, where maybe seeing a third person, it's a little more detached. Um, I don't have my own issues, uh, my own emotions that are going to stop me from seeing it more rationally. I mean, you know, at least a little bit. Well, sometimes, too, I think they can comment on how the other characters in a book or a movie are behaving, too. And that will give you insight on how other children in your child's life are treating it in the same way. They might not say, John is being mean to me at school because I'm adopted, but they might say, this character in the book was mean to so-and-so and, -so and expose their issue that way. Mm. Yeah, I think so, too. Like, I, I've thought that there's, like, you know, when you're talking about a book or a, a movie... Uh, with someone, I mean, there's there's ways that we can talk about it directly, like, you know, have you ever felt that way, or has that ever happened to you? 
and then um, but then indirectly might be even more effective much of the time where it's yeah what do you think this person was feeling I mean there's there's two different ways to talk about the same story and uh, you know one of them might be easier for some kids than other you know sometimes I've, I've started recommending too some of these wordless picture books for kids for families um, I review it on the website because then they have to provide the story. It's not about them, um, mm. and yet it reveals them so much. It's really fascinating to see. Would you so for things, t picture books and stuff like that? Is that something that you would? What would you guys refer for older kids as opposed to younger kids? I think that's something that um, I, I know with different books on adoption and different things like that. It's geared toward, I'm seeing a lot geared toward elementary or toddlers. What do you do for the for older kids, or, or do you use the same things? Mm. So, so I mean, maybe you, you're the social worker, Addison, but I, I think so often our kids are emotionally less mature than their chronological age. A lot of times they will respond to it. It's just kind of the way you offer the book. Is kind of setting it. Maybe that you can ask them to critique the book for a friend that has a younger child and make them the book reviewer as opposed to this is the book I want you to read. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's probably a good approach. And I like what you said, Gil, that sometimes kids are at different, in some areas of their life, they're at different stages than their chronological age would suggest. Um, I remember uh, a training that Nancy Thomas gives about attachment that says, you know, Sometimes even like preteens just want to be held and rocked because that's that's still some that's like a stage that needs to happen for them. Um, you know, I, yeah, I think if you can present a book uh, in a way to get around the oh that's for kids object, it, it can still be really helpful. I think what what Gail said is uh, is spot on, mm -hmm. and um, and so many of the kids' books. Um, I'm thinking of like you know a new Barker in the house or a mother for Choco. They address things that are relevant to not just young kids, you know, being part of a multicultural family or uh, other books about just how adoption happens or a kid's journey through foster care. You know, even if they're written for, uh, with, with the main character being little or seven or eight, um, you know, the themes are still relevant to older kids. And I think what Gail said about saying, hey, could you critique this for, you know, how would this be for younger kids? Could it be valuable to older kids? And, and putting the kid in the, in the role, not just of here's something for you to read, I think it'll help you, but hey, what do you think of this? Uh, it might be a good way to get around the defenses. Well, and like Addison, Addison reviews movies that are not specifically about adoption. On writing to connect, 95% of the books that I'm reviewing, I, I do an adoption attuned book review, but it's not about adoption. It, it, it's about look at, at the various seeds in the storyline that can be expanded into a discussion that's relevant to adopted families. And then it doesn't feel like a big conversation about what to talk <laughs> about adoption. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Gail, you're 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 so great with that, and I, I see that in movies too. Like, you know, every now and then I'll get feedback like this story doesn't mention adoption at all, and it's like, well, that's true. But it, uh, like, Finding Dory doesn't mention adoption at all, but it has so much relevance. Um, and in fact, the fact that it doesn't mention adoption might be helpful for a lot of families because it's not so in your face. Um, you know, it. it it kind of lends itself to you know indirect and uh, and more subtle ways to getting to the conversations, which is um, you know whereas if you're watching a movie like uh, you know like Meet the Robinsons, it's like hey, <laughs> this isn't like relevant to adoption. This is this this kid's been in 120 different interviews trying to find a family. Um, I mean, it is uh, certainly going to be helpful for some kids, but for other kids, it is like right in your face. <laughs> right. And again, different tools for different kids. You know, different tools for different situations. Um, but they they are they are different. Uh, yeah. What are you talking something about? doesn't have to be an adoption story to be helpful to an adoptive family. You're talking about sometimes it's right in your face. There's a book that's been circulated on my Facebook feed. Uh, something to the effect of so and so lost his name, and I haven't read the book. But just the concept. If you're an adoptee who's been given a brand new name and a new identity in a new country. Maybe that book isn't for you, so it, it, that's kind of the corollary too. Watching mm. what we're, we're reading to our kids. Yeah, we've seen, um, like you have, you said, so many times, books that were targeted towards younger children, um, really effective with older kids. Um, 
and a lot of times bringing in those books that have nothing to do with adoption or it's it's a theme that kind of lies underneath um, but just a little story have you guys read um, Robbie the Rabbit's Trail Through Adoption or Robbie the Rabbit's Trail Through Foster Care? I haven't read that one. Um, I, go ahead. I've heard of it. <laughs> yeah, um, it's written by a man named Adam Robe who was a foster child himself and was adopted. And um, we had a summer camp that we did several years back um, with a group of foster and adoptive kids and then, you know, some uh, siblings in there that were um, birth children and that kind of thing. So it was kind of a mix of kids. Um, but they were basically 4 to 14 was the range that we had in that summer camp. I'd say Robbie the Rabbit's kind of an elementary school book. Um, but we had read it with them one day um, during camp. And then after, you know, we talked about it a little bit. And then afterwards, we had free time. So they were, you know, go outside, play basketball, play on the playground, whatnot. And I cannot express the middle schoolers. I mean, coming back and saying, no, we don't want to go outside. Let's read Robbie the Rabbit again. Let's talk about it. Because they, had so, they were just so eager to see this media that was something that they could relate to. You know, you see so many books about, you know, um, we had you at the hospital and we brought you home and yeah, you know, but these kids could not relate to that. Um, this little rabbit that gets taken into foster care and ends up in the house of pigs and you know with a squirrel and a kangaroo as foster siblings and and just his his story they were so able to relate to and they're like no just read read to us again read to us again. Um, and we did a lot of that over the three weeks of camp, reading that same story over and over, and they would sit in a circle and they would talk um, and talk about how they felt, and it was really powerful. Wow. Well, how I want to ask you guys another question is how we're talking about using media. How, as a caregiver, do you know if you're being successful using that media? I mean, I think a lot of people would agree that they, they feel something when they watch a movie or hear a song. How do you know that you've been successful? Well, I would say the first thing that comes to mind is actually uh, to say that you don't have to... Um, avoiding something isn't always the right answer. Uh, if a kid has a hard time with a movie or if they tear up or something, it doesn't mean you've done wrong. Um, I mean be careful and know what you're getting into ahead of time, but an emotional reaction is, is it's kind of a crisis, but a crisis is an opportunity to, to process stuff. Like, hey, this really seems to have connected with you pretty profoundly. I mean, I wouldn't probably say it that way to, like, a six-year-old, but, like, hey, it seems like you got this. What's going on? You know, being there and I mean, any conversation is probably good, as long as it's a place where the kid feels safe to talk about what they're feeling. Um, and then, you know, just be being um, being intentional about knowing what's in the movie and not putting something that they're totally not ready for. Right. Um, yeah, I would say with books, too, you should always pre-read a book before you read it with your child. And I would also say, if it's a book you can see is triggering your child, it's not necessary to complete a book. That may be something you complete over time and as they get ready to finish whatever that topic is, that they might pull that book off the shelf. Um, at a later time, but you, you certainly discovered that there is something there. They might not be ready to examine it, but it's a piece of information, a piece of valuable information. Yeah, and I, I love what you said, Gail, about um, always pre-reading a book. I remember a story someone was telling me recently about, uh, you know, back in elementary school when you would sit on the floor and your teacher would read the class a storybook uh, to kind of instill a love of reading. And I guess the teacher hadn't pre-read the book, and so they were saying, like, we were listening to it every afternoon, every afternoon, and then all of a sudden it just stopped. And uh, I think what probably happened there was the teacher read a couple chapters ahead and was like, oh, no. <laughs> uh, Either that or she was trying to make you borrow the library book yourself so you could find out how it ended. <laughs> it could be that. I like, I like that better. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, we've actually had, um, with book reviews and such, we've actually had it where at one point we were reading a book and reviewing it, and we were reading it with our youngest little guy, and we got to a point where we're like, huh, that's a little bit too much information on the birthing process for <laughs> an eight-year-old. So <laughs> we, even with reviewing books, I think we, we would agree with that. Yeah. Um, how, on the flip side, what are things, we've talked about how you know that you're successful, and I'm hearing you guys saying, you know, if it draws out some sort of conversation or just something, that there's success in that. What are the mistakes that caregivers can make when using books or, or movies or different things to talk with their children? We already said, you know, look at the book or the media ahead of time, but what are some other mistakes caregivers can make when they're trying to do something with media with their kid? Hmm. Well, the first thing that comes to mind uh, would be assuming that every moment has to be a teachable moment. I mean, I'd say I'd say make opportunities for your kids. Show movies that have relevance ahead of time. Know what the relevant points might be and what conversations could happen. But you know, don't don't make it like this big thing where now we're going to sit down and we're going to watch a fun movie and then I'm going to talk to you about adoption. I mean, it's. Uh, just just let the opportunities be there and some of them will blossom into big conversations and others of them will just, or, or for books too, some of them will blossom into these big conversations, sure, and others of them will just be really pleasant memories of sitting down and sharing hot cocoa and a great story or uh, a bag of popcorn and a fun movie um, and, and that's okay too, you know not everything has to be a big clinical <laughs> meaning there, there's meaning also in, in just enjoying being with each other you know, um, so stress less. Maybe that's the. Uh... <laughs> I like that. I love that. For me, I would say it's the nurturing. You know, have them in your lap, or if they have, if they have touch issues, sit on the sofa together, side by side. Make it a, a nurturing moment, but don't race through the book. Completion's not not really the goal. The goal is to spend time together. Uh, explore the book, maybe just discuss the, the pictures if you want. And if you sense that the child wants to explore some of those seeds that are there, do it, but let the child take the lead um, unless they never do. And then at that point, maybe you want to be a little bit more uh, assertive or aggressive and bring you something up. No, I really like that because I think it's so much time, I think, as caregivers, we want to put more stress on ourselves than we need to and I think a lot of times we forget just the fun. like I like what is being brought up is the nurturing the bonding just being there with each other and sitting there watching a movie or reading a book together that's success enough it doesn't have to be a profound heavenly light come down from the sky aha moment it just can just be spending time together and that's success enough well, um, and, and yeah. Darren, that goes back to the that goes back to like the, the very first question, you know, what are some of the valuable things of reading a book or watching a movie? And um, you know, at, like like we said earlier, you can get so much out of it, but one of the things is is the it's nurturing to yourself. It's it's self-care. It replenishes you to right. have a little bit of time where you're just investing in your own rejuvenation. Um, and and so often we don't do that whether, you know, as parents or or as professionals. Um, I mean, burnout is a real thing, and uh, man, finding ways to avoid that, that's, that's so valuable. Um, and in the same way, like, you know, if, if, you, if you treat your relationship like a person, if you're working it all the time, uh, maybe it gets tired. And if you give it a little bit of time to just rest and breathe by sitting down on the couch and reading a book together or, uh, you know, sitting down next to each other and, and sharing a Slurpee while you watch the next thing from Disney, like you know, that nurtures the relationship just in the same way that, you know, taking me time nurtures you. It, it lets it have energy to do the work that it needs to do uh, later. Well, I think, too, so often in adoptive families, we have a lot of stresses and a lot of challenges and maybe more than the average family. And sometimes we get so caught up in, in addressing our issues that we forget to have fun. And fun really is the bridge that, that may makes them care about being part of our families. If it's never any fun, then where do they want to attach? Mm -hmm. So we, we can't, that's a really important thing to have fun as a family. 
Yeah, and I think being um, available and approachable on talking about issues, and I know sometimes, you know, you watch something and then, you know, maybe even a couple weeks later, you realize that there was a seed that was planted and there's a question. Um, you know, just really randomly, we were watching Hoarders one time, and it just happened that um, there was there was a removal. Um, you know, Child Protective Services got called um, on the show, and there was a removal. And probably for the two weeks after that, we found ourselves just kind of having to be available for you know questions um, because that was a question. Then, well, well, what happened with us? How did that process go down? Um, you know, because it was something they really, you know, they, they're not exposed to that as the kids. They don't know how that all works. They just know someone came and took them um, and they went to a foster home. And so it kind of showed them what that process was, what happened. And so then it really led to a lot of good conversations over the following two weeks. And, and you wouldn't think, I mean, it's hoarders. <laughs> not something, you know, that we necessarily thought was going to happen. Um, but it really helped the kids kind of process some of their own story, um, finding out, and, and there was a lot of things we didn't know. Of course, we weren't involved early on in either case with our kiddos, but it was um, important for us to be available to answer those questions for them um, after they saw that. And I, I think in general, you know, they, they see things at school, um, they see things on the bus, and they talk, you know, there's all kinds of, they're using media more and more at school. Mm -hmm. um, actually, our daughter was required for middle school um, to read Bud, Not Buddy. Um, and so that was, it was a good opportunity for me then to read the book, to be able to talk about it with her, um, you know, to know what, what are they talking about at school. And this is a book that could be triggering. Um, it could also lead to some good conversation. Well, let me ask, this will be my last question before I open it up to our, our general public. Um, we, and I, I hate to end it on a negative question, but uh, maybe it's not negative, it's just guarding. We, I, I think I'll be the first one to embrace media. I love movies, I love books, songs, um, I love technology. Um, I think they're a phenomenal tool. But as experts, I think as, as caregiver, the caregiver side of me wants to ask you guys, what are the major issues with modern media, movies, books, the new things coming out? What are the things that I need to watch out for as a caregiver? Um, and maybe even some things with foster and adoptive issues that other parents aren't having to worry about. What are things that are trauma triggers? Or, or in, just in general, what are things that I need to be watching out for in media? Oh man, so many movies. Uh, I mean, I was uh, I was just watching one uh, that's a recent one. I won't say what it is in case you haven't seen it. Uh, you know, so I don't spoil it. But um, but within the first few minutes, uh, both of this kid's parents died in a in a traumatic way on screen. And I thought to myself, I was like, man, every single movie uh, that's geared towards this age group seems to feature. Or, well, seems to, like, the parents dying is just kind of the plot in so many of these movies. And this time when it happened, I just thought to myself, I was like, wow, it didn't even make it to the title screen before the parents died. Like, they they died in the prologue, you know, in the, in the prologue before the, right. the movie's title popped. Like, wow, that was quick. And uh, one of the folks who commented on um, on my Facebook page where I, uh, I posted a link to the review of the movie, so if you go there, you'll find out which movie I'm talking about, so maybe don't. But uh, or else it'll be a spoiler. But um, but one person said, why does every kids movie have to, um, have to be like this way? And I was really surprised. Like usually, if someone comments on something that I wrote, you know, maybe someone will respond or something. But within a day or two, like there, were, you know, 15 likes on that on that person's comment. You know, within just a couple days, it's like I think that really resonated with a lot of people. Why do so many of these movies kill off the parents so quickly? Right. And for for kids who have lost a parent in one way or another, um, 
uh, it can it can have more significance to them than for a kid who that's just a purely hypothetical uh, concept, you know? Right. Um, yeah, I definitely agree with that. Well, and I think that oftentimes kids that come into care because of abuse and neglect, there are also the hidden triggers there of which we, we, we as their adoptive parents we may not even recognize. And so sometimes they are vulnerable to an unexpected trigger of a piece of music, a scene, a sound, um, the description of an accident, whatever, and be sensitive to that when they talk about it. But I think it's really important that we pre-read or pre-watch, and I said this earlier, the material that's coming to them because we have at least a better idea of what those triggers might be and where they're vulnerable. That might be perfectly safe for the average kid, but for our kids, we because of their personal histories, might be painful or triggering. So there's yeah. an extra, extra level of, of monitoring. And along those lines, um, I was talking with a therapist about a safety plan at one point um, in terms of viewing media. And, you know, the therapist had said, you know, for, the, for children who have sexual triggers, um, nothing above PG-13. And so, you know, I'm thinking along the lines of, okay, so we don't want to trigger anything that has sex, any type of sexual content. And she said, no, not, it's not just sexual content. She said, you also have to watch out for violence and language. Even though it's not sexual in nature, it's still arousal. So something can have absolutely no connection at all to, you know, sexual abuse or just even promiscuity, anything sexual in nature, um, but it'll arouse the same neurotransmitters, you know, you have the same physical response, and it'll stress the body, and it can lead to negative behaviors, even though it's not, you, you don't think it's really linked to that behavior. Um, so really kind of being mindful of not just and it can go the same way, you know, for other, if you've got a child who's experienced domestic violence or something like that, other types of arousal can still lead to the same triggers. Hmm. Well, and the other thing, too, is to remember that you can shut off the video, you can't, you, you don't have to finish the book, you might want to stop, talk about it, but, mm -hmm. um, walk out of the movie if you're at the theater, and, Sometimes we forget we have that permission. You don't have to stay. Right. Yeah, I mean, and that can be empowering for a kid too. If you if you let the kid know, uh, your kid know, um, hey, if if something's too intense, just say so. And um, you know, I don't know. I'm trying to think like maybe there's like a, a code word that you can use to say like, hey, let's take a break from this and talk about it later. I think a great code word would be let's go get ice cream. Um, <laughs> Any reason why? Like, I like ice cream. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, no, seriously. I mean, anybody. You know, it's it's natural to feel a little bit like, is it really okay to stop a movie? Is it really okay to stop this book? Am I gonna Am I gonna bum out my parents if I yeah. if I say that I need to stop watching this show? Um, but you know, something that's that's a little bit fun, a little bit funny, uh, maybe take a little bit of the edge off. You know, let's go get ice cream. <laughs> um, you know, talk about it through the ice cream. Like, hey, so that was kind of rough for you. Yeah, it was. But man, this uh, this frozen yogurt's delicious. So <laughs> I don't know. It also yeah. starts to have a new pattern of a good association. <laughs> it starts to have yeah. Like yeah, yeah. Think, I, now you said that. That's that's so true. Yeah, you did the hard thing of of expressing your needs. Mm -hmm. I, I need this to stop right now. Doesn't mean we're never going to go back to it. Doesn't mean mm -hmm. we're not going to talk about it. But to immediately reward that with uh, let's do something pleasant that kind of cuts through the awkwardness of saying I need to stop, um, and talk about it when you know when you're ready. And obviously, you have to have that discussion ahead of time. And when you have that mm -hmm. discussion ahead of time, it's got to feel very authentic to your kids that it really is okay even we just spent thirty dollars on the tickets it really is okay to say I can't stay well and I think you guys what I'm hearing too is something else that I think is hard for our kids too is they think um, they, they don't always work since they're in survival mode in their brain mm -hmm. they don't always 
work with, okay, I can do it later. It's either now or never. Like, and I'm even thinking with books coming out, um, Margie and I were at a convention where the, the Cursed Child came out, and, I mean, people were just flocking to bookstores and buying, like, so, again, it's one of those, if they can't handle that, they're thinking, if I walk away from this book, I'm never going to read it again. It's done. It's gone. It's, it, it's like uh, what I've experienced with my parents or my biological parents. It's gone forever. This book is gone. So I think you guys are hitting on a, a, a big thing there. Um, but I am going to stop us because I'm going to allow people to ask their questions. We, uh, again, if you want to ask your questions, I have a question and answer panel on Google Hangout you can access on your desktop if you're watching us, and I will get them. Also, if you want to use the hashtag T, that's it, T as in Tom, adopt, T, adopt. If you use that on Twitter or Facebook, I will find your question, and we will ask it to our panelists. Um, let's see here. Let me, let me go click on the right thing for our questions here. Okay, do you, do you have any, and this looks like it's for anyone, do you have any advice about how teachers can use books to help kids from trauma in the classroom? We don't just, we, we just don't have the time to spend on discussion one-on-one -on -one with a kid. Hmm. And I can read that again if you need me to. I don't know one that specifically addresses trauma, but Jacqueline Woodson came out with a lovely picture book called um, Each Kindness. And, and yeah. it highlights the fact, it tells a story through a little girl who was not the other. She was part of the community of girls that is mean to the other children, to the one outsider girl. And, and the, the point of the book is um, the girl moves away before they can make amends, and she had wanted to make amends. Oh, wow. um, and she realizes that that chance is no longer available to her. So I think that's a very powerful piece of awareness to kind of look at it through the point of, I've been a bully, and now I, I'd like to change, and I can't. It's very short. The illustrations are lovely. Um, and it's, it's, it's a fabulous book. Again, it's called Each Kindness by Jacqueline Woodson. And I've recently reviewed it on, on my website which is galhswift.com, and basically they're all reviewed with the idea of adoption attunement. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I've got a, a specific recommendation for the situation, but I, I can understand, um, you know, ad addressing an, an audience, you know, or, or your class, um, and not having time to talk with each kid one on one, but what you might do is is just make sure that you're communicating uh, back home for those kids to say, hey, this is something we're going to cover. These are a couple universal or general points I'm going to make connected to the book, um, and then maybe even uh, you know here's a couple places, you know, a couple ways that you might want to take the conversation with your kid when they come home from school um, that I wouldn't be able to do with them one on one. Um, but I, I, I mean. I would definitely defer to Gail on book recommendations. <laughs> well, there's another book that came out too. It's called Unselfing. I've forgotten the name of the lady that wrote it. And it's for adults. But basically, the premise is as we teach our kids to be more empathetic, which is not an academic subject, it, it actually helps them succeed in life and in academics because being human is more important than being a good scholar or being a good athlete. Right. It allows us to, to develop it entirely. And it's a, a really useful book, book that outlines the ways families can teach them, their children to be empathetic. And so that's a good one for families to read. It's a little bit dry, but very, very good. Again, called Unselfie. Okay, and I'm going to move on to the next question here. Um, next question is... This one is going to be... Uh, I guess anyone can answer it, but it looks like it's specifically for Addison. I grew up watching the old musical version of Disney's Pete's Dragon. I'm really excited for our adoptive son to be introduced to this story from my childhood. I'm curious what Addison thinks about the movie. Um, I liked it. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, uh, I'm going to try to do this without spoiling anything. Um, there, are <laughs> there are definitely some parts 
there are some scenes in the film that could be a little bit rough for kids who've experienced trauma or loss. And I try to spell those out um, pretty explicitly on uh, the review on my website, uh, Adoption at the Movies. Um, but except for those scenes, um, I think the dragon it, it comes across like a, a friendly, fluffy dog uh, <laughs> that can fly and it's very protective. Uh, I think that there's definitely a sense of uh, Pete finding uh, finding something to replace what he lost, or to you know to come up not not to replace in the sense that what he lost needs to be he lost something and he found something that meets the need that he had. Um, well, I probably spoiled it, but not very much. Um, <laughs> well, it's a Disney movie. It has a happy ending. Of course it does. There um, you go. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I'd say check out the review. Just make sure that the stuff that um, that I'm kind of picking out is maybe concerning uh, isn't going to be too rough for your kid. Um, but there is a lot of good in the movie, and it, it was a nice one to watch. Okay. Um, I have two foster girls in my home. The kids have been sexually abused and they have entered that preteen phase of life. Is there some sort of books or movies that could help me talk about healthy relationships or even move them through the trauma? Mm. And that one's for everyone. Mm. I see wheels turning and people wrestling over the question as I speak. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of a, of a movie that shows, like, I don't know, really, uh, really respectful relationships. And, uh, um, I mean, my, my initial thought would be to to find movies where the relationships are, are really positive uh, and, and respectful and loving, kind of like using the, like, or the, using the story to model what it should look like. I don't know, maybe like Anne of Green Gables where Anne and Gil fall in love, you know? Mm -hmm. um, that's a spoiler alert too, but that book's been out for like 120 years, so <laughs> if you haven't read it by right. now. Right. Um, but, you know, modeling something where the relationship is positive. Um, the work of actually addressing really profound sexual abuse, that that might be something where you're going to want to team up with a, with a therapist who knows your case one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but using movies or books to model healthy relationships might be the way to, to go. Again, just kind of creating opportunities for your kids to, to see how stuff could be, rather than trying to make, a, you know, to manufacture a teaching moment. Um, first thought. What do you guys think? Yes, I'm sorry. Marjorie, look. I'm racking my brain, <laughs> um, and we, I, I actually handed off a book yesterday that I haven't had a chance to review that another professional is going to review for our website coming up soon, um, called How Long Does It Hurt? A Guide mm. to Recovering. Um, I have no idea if it's good or not, but it's directed towards kind of the teenage age, and Addison, I don't know if it's a book you've heard of or dealt with at all. No, uh, this, I don't know of it, um, other than what you're telling me. Okay. Um, like I said, I don't know. I, I'm not going to recommend or not recommend it at this point because I haven't read it yet. It's been sitting on the shelves with all the other books I need to get through. Um, so, like I said, another professional picked that up and is going to be reading it and reviewing it for our site soon, hopefully. Um, but... And, and the audience, you said it's pre-teen girls, so it might be just slightly too, it looks like it's directed more towards teenagers um, who've been sexually abused. Well, so. one book that I will say that I, that I because I, on the website, uh, I do help with our children's books, and I know this would be younger, this would be more like, I think it was ages two to six, but again, we were talking about kids are kind of emotionally younger than what they really are in our industry here, or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's a book by Jane Evans called Cyril Squirrel Finds Out About Love, and that one was, um, I'm not sure, yeah, it does a good job of showing relationships, but, but just, she does a good job, too, of talking about how emotions go along with uh, different things like love and kindness, um, and she'll do a good job of explaining what you might be feeling, and her illustrator shows, like, 
like it, it, there there's one point in the book where a character is mistreating um almost a, not I don't want to say emotionally abusing but kind of emotionally abusing the squirrel and it kind of shows that he has this whizzy tornado stuff going on in his stomach to sh- as part of hey this isn't right and this is how one of the ways I know that it's not right is I don't feel right in my stomach so that they the kids can kind of start sensing how they feel with different emotions and stuff like that um, but that's that. I don't know if it solves everything the question's asking for, but it's called Cyril Squirrel Finds Out About Love. Hmm. Well, and I think nowadays it's really important, and I said this earlier, to, to read everything because it's so, formerly taboo subjects are routinely, routinely mentioned in books nowadays, so you want to be careful on, on how it's handled. Mm hmm. You know, things that wouldn't have been in, in a book 10 or 15 years ago. Right. So. Yep. Last question that I'm going to ask, and then we're going to wrap up here. Um, last question I have is, I think it's a question. I get that books, movies, and stuff can help you connect with your kid. What do you do when your foster son won't watch a, a movie, listen to a book, nothing? He is a bundle of energy until he goes to sleep. Uh, just be present with him. Um, try to try to interact with him on his level, and you know, join in there. You know, what what game is he playing in his imagination uh, when he's running around? Uh, I mean, is he a race car? Is he a superhero? Is he a ball player? Um, maybe you can maybe you can join into that imagination and and. You know, instead of watching a story or reading a story, you can help make the story or at least participate in the story that your foster son's making. Well, and kind of piggyback on, on that, Addison, I'd say do think it's like, like you have a giant, <clears throat> a giant carton and uh, make something out of it and then make up a story as you go along. You know, is it a castle? Is it a ship? Is it whatever? Uh, and make it a family project. And, uh, and make up a yeah. for that character. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like, you know, your kid's kind of creating stories, uh, probably creating stories, maybe just running around, but there's probably some <laughs> stories going on there. And, and, uh, and we, really do, we really do learn through stories. We express ourselves through stories, and, and maybe your kid's stories are, uh, are subconscious stories, or they're, they're not verbal stories, but they're there. They're there, and, you know, you can join in with them. And, right. like, like... Yeah. So sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. I was gonna say you might even uh, write down what they said the night before. When you at the end of the evening, write something down and then read it back to him the next day. Well, I really enjoyed your story. Maybe we'd make, like to make some pictures together, or uh, do some video if, if they're comfortable in front of the camera. Make a video of a story to, to oh, reach your little brother or to send to Granny. Don't put push you ought to read or push that you ought to see the movie because anytime you get into that push, 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 they got they gotta push back. Mm-hmm. Okay. This yeah. is the last this is the last sorry. This is the last question I have and it's mine and we're gonna end with this. What uh, what movie or book have you looked at lately that you think that caregivers need to check out? Oh, uh, Inside Out for sure. Um, uh, Inside Out is uh, came out about a year ago, uh, maybe a little more. It's uh, you, you've probably seen it. It's the movie with the uh, uh, the eleven year old girl and her five emotions that are controlling her, and we see from the point of view of her of her mind. And uh, well, it is um, it is so intelligent and and so well done entertaining and heartwarming and uh, and so deep with stuff to, to reflect on for your kids and for yourself. Um, uh, Adoption of the Movies, we've got the uh, Adoption of the Movies Awards every year and it won, uh, you know, when uh, we actually had a lot of people vote this year and it won Best Animated Movie and Best Movie Overall and it, it, it's so good. It's so good. Um, it did. I love that one. It did. That was another one. We were talking about which movie were oh up that you cry you were talking about crying at yeah yeah totally cried at inside out <laughs> yeah and big hero 6 too if i was going to throw a second one in there uh, 
Big Hero 6 is, uh, is another really fun movie. There's a really nurturing character. Uh, one of the characters experiences some really profound loss of family members and then finally has to, uh, has to accept a loss, uh, which shows how far uh, that character has grown. Um, such a, mm. wow, so many good movies. Uh, um, I watch way more movies than I read books. Uh, that probably <laughs> doesn't make me very smart. Uh, <laughs> so, no way. But Gail, I will move to you. What What do you have? What do you think? I think one great book is The Five Love Languages for Children. Ooh, okay. It's very powerful uh, and really um, helpful in terms of identity. If you think of communication as being dialectic, you know, that's uh -huh. some people some you absorb more from being nurtured and touched, some from words of affirmation, some from little thoughtful gifts. If you know that about your kiddo, it helps to make whatever nice gesture you're trying to do to connect with them more effective. And also, if you're aware of their five love languages, you never want to punish them in their primary love language. Oh, yeah. I never thought of that. So it's really well worth reading. Um, for kids' books, one of my favorites that we've done lately is um, The Boy Who Built a Wall Around Himself by Allie Redford. Great book. Our, across the board, all of our kids loved it. Um, there's a lot of subtleties in it that um, were really powerful and had a big impact on all of our kiddos. Oh, Darren, I have to mention one more. The, the yeah. Invisible Boy. The Invisible Boy is a great book. Um, he's invisible to everybody. Uh, so that's powerful in terms of fitting in. Fantastic. Well, I could keep going all night long with questions, but we have simply run out of time. Uh, thank you to our panel for being a part of this and helping all of you caregivers out there, and thank you to the caregivers that watched and your questions. Um, again, I will say that uh, next month we have, uh, I actually forget, I think it's the 16th, September 16th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time is our next discussion panel, and we will be talking about when partners don't agree on how to parent the kids. Um, so you're going to want to be there for that, and also just check out uh, our website, www.transfiguringadoption.com, for more resources and fun things to do with your kids and bond and connect. And I also want to uh, make sure that you check out Adoption at the Movies and also uh, gift families, or no, not gift, yeah, it's gifts. Just my coaching and the book reviews of gaylhswift.com, Writing to Connect, Adoption at Two and Book Reports, Book Reviews. And also check out Gail's book, ABC Adoption and Me. But thank you so much for joining us. I'm Darren Fink with Transfiguring Adoption. I hope that this has helped you to nurture and grow your foster or adoptive family.